It might seem like Jim Bumstead is doing all the work. He'll sift through 100 buckets in one afternoon. But it's all the help he gets that puts him in business. I got about 50,000 workers. None of them has tried to unionize or health insurance or anything yet. <laughs> Every week, he harvests a kind of black gold in his backyard. It's a pile of worms. <laughs> Jim Bumstead raises earthworms, but he doesn't sell the worms. He sells what the worms leave behind. That is earthworm manure. There's nothing but pure fertilizer right there. He's after what comes out of the earthworms, their castings. Had a uh, master gardener tell me it's like, uh, like plants being on steroids, and uh, they grow so much and so fast. One of nature's best and safest plant fertilizers. Inside this building, Jim has set up a little factory. He provides organic material and a grain he's not allowed to disclose, and the earthworms, they just do what worms do. That is what is eaten and produced out the back end. They eat everything in that bucket pretty much in 10 days, what they can, what they can actually digest. So this earthworm wrangler separates out the earthworms and their eggs from the castings. The worms go back to work and make more castings and more worms. They'll, they'll hatch out in about seven to 10 days. I'll have a whole bunch of little baby worms in here. Jim just stumbled onto the idea. I was just up one night researching on the internet. <laughs> he hooked up with a Wisconsin company called Unco. With its know-how and Jim's willingness, a business is born. But I'm usually out here by myself. It's uh, my long time. You don't really have to think <laughs> to do this. <laughs> and so it's kind of nice. So Jim and his worms toil away. They eat and do the other thing, and he sifts. Together, they make what comes natural. In Buna, Tom Wright, KFDM 6 News. These college students have traveled almost 2,000 miles to put down roots. They're on a service trip from St. Michael's College in Vermont during their semester break. It's, uh, it's nice to be out here in beautiful weather and, um, and having this opportunity to give back to the environment. And what they're doing is nothing less than helping change the face of a forest. It's our hope within within the next several decades that these longleaf pines will start to get established. They're planting longleaf pines, a tree that once dominated the pine forest of the southern United States, but today covers only about 2% of where it historically could have been found. The trees were logged at the same time they were denied their most important natural element, fire. Longleaf pine has to have fire to survive and Within the past hundred years, there's been a lot of fire suppression. Longleaf pine spends seven to eight years looking like a clump of grass while it puts down a deep taproot. At this stage and throughout its life cycle, the tree is adapted to withstand fire. Deep into this grass stage seedling is a bud and all of these needles protect that bud from fire and they can completely burn off um, and, and they'll protect it from the heat. Fire eliminates, or at least slows down, competing plants. So every few years, these potential forests need prescribed burns. And someday, this could look the way it might have 100 years ago. Tall, longleaf pines in a park-like forest. It'd be awesome if I could come back in like maybe 20, 40, 30 years or so, so, and see if anything that I did actually like lived. Preparing, planting, and maintaining this future forest is labor intensive and slow going. But one day these college students may have to look up to see the results of the roots they've planted. In Tyler County, Tom Wright, KFDM 6 News. This is what you see, all you see. Cruising after dark in an airboat on the Blue Elbow Swamp. It's already scary being out in the swamp in, you know, in the pitch dark. This airboat tour company in Orange offers day tours and night tours of the Blue Elbow. But this coming weekend, Halloween weekend, 
it's adding something a little extra to the darkness. I'll tell you what, the swamp, anybody that's been out in the woods, it's one thing, but the swamp, it has this natural resource like the gators we've been seeing. I mean, you have, there's, there's a, you have that sense of danger regardless, but then when you throw all this other stuff in we're gonna have, it's gonna be a good time. By day, this is an ecological wonderland. But here in the dark, it's what you don't see that keeps you guessing. The creepy thing is you don't know where somebody's gonna come from out here. There's a lot of territory to cover. So with our natural fear of wild places in the dark and a little creative theatrics, remember, on an airboat, there's no place to run. In Orange, Tom Wright, KFDM 6 News. Hopefully, in the next two years or so, you'll see some major, major changes, along with the ones that we've already done, and make the gardens into a 12-month garden instead of just a summertime summertime event so people can come at any time last year we had a you know a, a couple different freezes this year we had a three-day freeze and that kind of activity is really tough on tropical so we've um, when you look around the gardens you can see that the, some of them are stressed but we're going to let them just come back on their own you see disasters and things hanging around and, and, and happening all over the place but you also see moments of uh, brilliance um, that nature has uh, putting forth things. So we look forward to a little bit more growth. The meditation room is now, uh, because we have about 35 people who come here every week uh, for meditation on Wednesday nights about 7 o'clock. Let me get some smoke. Biddy Rhodes is practicing a form of beekeeping that dates back thousands of years. If you smoke them, they think their home is burning down, so they go inside gorge themselves on honey, puts them in a kind of a euphoria. What's different about Benny's bee box from the ones you'll find in most commercial bee yards is its simplicity. This is the top bar. This is where they suspend the comb from off the bottom of this triangular bar. It's called a top bar beehive. A more traditional bee box has frames with man-made foundations for the bees to build honeycomb and store honey. These are easy to build. They're, if you look at it, it looks like a hog trough. But a top bar beehive lets the bees make the foundation. That means less honey production, but it also means less fuss for the beekeeper. This is the only piece of equipment you have to have for the bees. It's just the body with the top bars. Those foundations require maintenance and storage. And all that might keep a beekeeper, well, as busy as a bee. Benny Rhodes hopes the top bar hive will encourage new beekeepers. Everybody knows we're running short on bees, and unless you want to eat rice, wheat, and corn all the rest of your life, everything else has got to be pollinated. The more bees we can get going, the better off everybody's going to be. And any gardener will benefit from bees doing what bees do. See, they're fairly gentle. They're not trying to attack anybody. This beekeeper stresses you still have to know bees, even with a simpler top bar beehive. A little bit of smoke, and you can open your hive up and do just about anything you want to do. Don't do it on a cloudy day or a rainy day, because there's not enough smoke in the world to settle them down then. People have been using something like the top bar hive to attract bees since ancient times. But it may be more important than ever as bees disappear from our modern world. In Orange, Tom Wright, KFDM 6 News.